Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we desire today to honor you as holy. We want to lift up Jesus Christ as Lord and sanctify him as Lord in our hearts. We ask God that you would sanctify us because we bear your name. We desire so much to see your kingdom come. We desire to see the return of the king for Christ to come back and to make all things new. But until then, Father, we want to do all that is in our power to advance your kingdom and glory and gospel in this world and do your will here just like it is in heaven. And we ask, God, that you would meet our needs as individuals and congregations, and especially the need we have to replace the roof on this building, Father, that you would supply the means and provide so that this very expensive project can be done and completed and the building can be once again tight and we can preserve this structure that you have given to us that we want to uh, steward wisely for your purposes and for your glory. And Father, as we travel through this world, we sometimes fall so short of your desires for us. We confess that we have sinned in thought, in word, in deed, in things that we have done and things that we have left undone. We ask God for your mercy and your forgiveness that you promise so freely. And as those who have received grace, God, we want to offer that grace to others. We ask that you would forgive us, even as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And Father, we pray that you would keep us from those trials and testings and temptations that might lead us away from you and that you would protect us by your good spirit and deliver us from the evil one, from his attacks, from his assaults, his temptations, his insinuations, his slanders, his lies. In all the ways that Satan wants to attack, Father, I pray that you would protect us. And in all these things, Father, we want to bring honor and glory to you because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If I asked you to write down what are perhaps the two or three greatest threats to Christianity today, what would be on your list? Who would you pick? Uh, I, I suppose it would be easy to look around us and see the seismic shift in our culture away from a, a Judeo-Christian consensus to a more secular, progressive, and pragmatic vision of America. Others might point to the collapse of moral certainties and authority and the triumph of a, of a kind of tolerance that polices language and marginalizes and criminalizes any, any statements of moral disapproval as somehow hate speech. Most would probably conclude that it, the greatest threats to American Christianity would come from the various isms that exist in our culture. Communism, secularism, humanism, postmodernism, scientism, materialism, consumerism, mysticism, wokeism, and on and on and on the lists go of all the ideologies and isms that exist in our world that draw us away from the faith of Jesus Christ. And all of those external to us are, are real and they pose significant challenges to God's people who, who live in two kingdoms. We, we live in the kingdom of God and we live in the kingdom of this world. And in our case, the, these United States. And Jesus warned us not to be surprised when the world hates his church. Um, Jesus' followers have always existed in a hostile spiritual environment. We're in the world, but not of the world. We're against the world, and yet for the world, because we're here as Christ representatives with his gospel. But as difficult as our world is, and the challenges to faith that come from them, the challenges within the church are, are perhaps easily as daunting, or maybe even more so, 
And, and as I've thought about this and thought about the direction this message is going in, in the book of Colossians, where our study is, I, I kind of found myself going down a rabbit trail. <laughs> and, and I want to go down that rabbit trail, and then we're going to come back and, and kind of get back on track with this. But I, I think one of, the, one of the challenges is not so much an assault within the church, but an assumption within the church. Something that we've just come to believe. Um, uh, the, we have uh, uh, assumed what we might call an attraction model for winning the world to Christ. Um, for a long time, many churches have taught and felt and thought that the right programming and, and upscaling our facilities and having modern technology that sometimes fails us and lets us down... <laughs> And good coffee and hip worship and relevant preaching and young entertaining people up front and it'll draw people like us to us and they're going to like us and they're going to join us and that's how we're going to win the world to Christ. We're going to attract people. You bring them here, preach, we'll get them saved and then we'll go on and just have a wonderful life together. And, and these are assumptions that I don't think anybody ever taught us. We just kind of absorbed them as we moved on through the world, but that's how we think. Um, they, they, they seeped into our social consciousness as the kind of thing that everybody just knows. And it's a, an assumption that, to be fair, I, I think I and many other pastors have shared for many, many years. And, and while any or all of those things may be significant in creating a more welcoming atmosphere to people who come, I mean, we don't want to have nasty, dirty, ugly facilities. We don't want to have a preacher who can't talk without stumbling over his words, and he gets his merge squicks and everything goes out sideways, you know. We want to have music that speaks to, in the language of the culture, all of those things. We, we don't want any unnecessary stumbling blocks to those who visit, but there's a couple of problems with that assumption that if we build it, they will come. And the first is that in, in striving to become a really up-to-date church, the kind of church everybody may want to join, we may find ourselves focused on seeking acceptance from our peers in the surrounding world and in the process become less bold about proclaiming the essential gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you think about the gospel in today's world, it's a strange message. Right? It's a strange message. We're, we're asking people to believe that the second person of the Trinity became a human, was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, died on a cross, was resurrected, and ascended to heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, and is coming again someday on a right ho white horse, and he's going to ride through the sky and conquer the world. That is a strange message for a lot of people. And as a result, we, we want to kind of soften that and make it more palatable, and we can't, because that is the gospel. Brett McCracken in, in, on a Gospel Coalition um, editorial writes this. He said, few things are worse for the individual Christian soul and the broader Christian witness than the quest for cultural acceptance. To consciously pursue credibility among the cool and applause from the cosmopolitan elite is almost always a step in the direction of theological compromise and spiritual atrophy. It's a problem that keeps popping up. Why? Because our fallen flesh is stubbornly drawn to the idol of respectability. I mean, none of us wants to be seen as fools in the world, do we? He goes on and says, whatever, whatever culture a Christ follower happens to be in, the temptation is to be an insider rather than an outsider acknowledged rather than dismissed, respected rather than ridiculed, a high-status power player rather than a powerless prod. And, and honestly, for most of us, we grew up in an era of Christendom where the church was one of the more dominant voices in the world. The second problem 
Now let me finish here. <laughs> the Bible teaches that it's the power of the gospel proclaimed boldly by people who demonstrate the authenticity of that gospel by one, loving one another deeply that is going to draw people to Jesus Christ. Everything else matters. All those other things do matter, but they are subordinate to, this, to the supremacy of the gospel and the exaltation of Jesus Christ. The, the, the second problem in our assumption about the attraction model is that the world has turned. And, and we know this. <laughs> the world has turned. We, we now live in a time when fewer people identify as Christian and fewer more identify as evangelical Christian. And the pool of people just like us that might be drawn to us and want to join us is shrinking. A, a recent Pew survey revealed in the last 10 years the number of people who identify as evangelical in the United States shrunk by 6%. Now, you start out with 24% 10 years ago to begin with, and now that's down 6%. And you project that out into the future, and you can see that if, if we follow current trends, we're in trouble. Um, of those who attend, who profess to be evangelical, only half attend services weekly on a regular basis. In, in his foreword to the book, How to Talk About Jesus Without Being That Guy, Ed Stetzer writes, there are many people, particularly those who are more secular, who have the general sense that the church is not the solution. In fact, they believe it might be part of the problem. And you've heard that, right? The church is not part of the solution, it's part of the problem. By the way, I, I would commend this book to you, um, Andrew Ford, who's been working with our search team, um, I had a meeting with him and some of the Converge pastors in, in Jackson this week, and he had this book and showed it, so I ordered it, and I've started to read it. It's really excellent. How to Talk About Jesus Without Being That Guy. <laughs> Personal Evangelism in a Skeptical World. It's a good, it's a good read so far, and I, I recommend you, it to you if you have a concern about how to share your faith in this world and get around some of these assumptions that we have adopted, this would be a good place to, to start in your own personal journey with that. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, everybody's awake now. Now that I have your attention. In the age that we have entered, church decline is going to continue unless we figure out how to get the gospel outside these walls and figure out how to talk effectively about Jesus and the high, to highly resistant unbelievers around us. To invite them to trust and follow Jesus, to baptize them, to di disciple them, to teach them to do everything Jesus commanded us, and enfold them into a congregation of believers who really believes and preaches the gospel. We're going to have to do that and restore evangelism to the whole church and not just the responsibility of the pastor. Um, and in America, that's harder than it's ever been before. And that's why we need resources like this. And we need pastors for a new age who know how to deal with this and can lead the church effectively in these others or these issues. Now, that's my rabbit trail. OK, but that's just been kind of a burden. It's been on my heart. It's been coming at me in a lot of different directions. I've been hearing about this. And as I talk about this the the whole idea of of the challenges faced by the church i think this is a huge one it, it it's an assumption it's not a false teaching that's been brought in and we're, we're now we're going to talk about some of those but it's something i think that has distorted our thinking and blunted our effectiveness but along with this assumption that that we've all got <laughs> There are 
other internal challenges that draw us away from faith and faithfulness down things that aren't rabbit trails, but now they're harmful and they take us away from biblical Christianity. And here we come to the heart of what we want to look at through the book of Colossians. For one thing, the evangelical church still affirms salvation by grace through faith. Right? We believe that. We're saved by grace. But then too often what we teach is now you're saved by grace, now you've got to live by law. Right? Um, we have pastors and teachers who in the name of biblical standards and holiness and all those other things say that, okay, you're saved, but you can't do this and this and this and this and this and this is suspect and you can't, and we're just, you know, there's something wrong with everything. And if you're doing it and they're not, they're going to find a reason why biblically you shouldn't be doing that because it's not biblical. The old word for that was legalism. It's still around. Um, I, I think it's been <laughs> demonstrated by scholars through the ages and, and pastors through the ages. That's ju that's just endemic to human nature. We're saved by grace, but then we want to do it on our own. Please God by our own efforts. And we're still figuring out, trying to figure out what it means to live by grace discerning the difference between performance-based, rule-driven Christianity and the freedom of spirit-filled living where we obey from the inside out because of the love of God that's been sh shed abroad in our heart and, and, and we have a spirit-empowered obedience to Christ that extends the same grace to others that we have received. It doesn't mean that there aren't standards. It doesn't mean that there is no law. Paul said, I'm not without law to Christ, but I'm under the law of Christ, which is the law of love. And love is an expression of all the laws of the Old Testament. But we live by grace. And there are some who would say, no, we, we live by laws and rules. And I love the fact that here at, at Calvary, a phrase that I've heard several times it's a value that's just been woven into the fabric of the church is that uh, we're going to err on the side of grace. We should. It doesn't mean we compromise our convictions. We hang on to those. But we want to be a grace-filled people. And there are people who would want to bring us back under bondage to rules. Another challenge facing the church, which is more now in the in kind of the progressive left wing of evangelical Christianity and then on over into other more liberal portions of Christianity is what I would call um, lead, red letter Christians. How many of you have a Bible where the words of Christ are in red? Many of you, right? Well, some people have taken it and said, those are the words that we really need to pay attention to. And, and the rest of Scripture, you know, it's important, but it's not as important as what Jesus said. And in fact, if there's any, if I think there might be a conflict between what Jesus said or Paul said or Timothy or the book of Hebrews or something like that, I'm going to go with what Jesus said as I understand it. And what they're doing, there's, there's just a subtle shift. They're saying not all scripture is inspired by God, but red letter portions are inspired by God. And I'm going to sit in judgment on everybody else. And so at the heart of their thinking is my own reason. Um, Tony Campolo is somebody who puts himself in that camp. And he describes red-letter red Christians this way. By calling ourselves red-letter Christians, we refer to the fact that in many Bibles the words of Jesus are printed in red. What we are asserting, therefore, is that we have committed ourselves first and foremost to doing what Jesus said. And, and that's important that we do what Jesus said. But what about the rest of Scripture that Jesus spoke by His Spirit through His apostles? And they would imply and sometimes outright say, state that that is not as inspired or authoritative. And they're dismissive of those parts with which they disagree. One <laughs> outcome um, I, I ran across online, this person says, only when Christianity comes to term with the values of enlightenment, free thought, respecting the rights and dignity of an individual, irrespective of his or her gender, sexuality, religious view, and combines these values with the great teachings of Christ, that is, to love people and not judge them, will Christianity survive? 
Otherwise, educated and enlightened souls will have no other way than to leave Christianity altogether, and people are leaving Christianity altogether. It's, it's kind of an outcome of going down that rabbit trail. Red letter Christians comprise one voice among many who in one way or another dis disregard the authority and the integrity of the Bible and place human reason as the arbiter of their religious convictions. It's the whole word of God that we have to cling to. Still another seductive voice within the evangelical community is what we call the health and wealth gospel. Jesus wants you to be prosperous. He wants you to be healthy. He wants you to be healed. He wants you to be whole. <laughs> You're a child of the king. He wants you to live like a prince or a princess. Now, <laughs> as defined by this world, and they forget that Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. All you need is enough faith. So you can live your best life now. Another disturbing common distortion has absorbed a, a, a mushy kind of faith that is best described as therapeutic moralistic deism. In other words, God wants you to feel better about yourself and be a nicer version of yourself. And otherwise, he's just not that involved in your life. I mean, he's there for you if you need him, but, you know, just... And, and that's kind of a mushy kind of Christianity. I had a conversation with a youth pastor once who, who basically, that's what he was teaching his young people about how to be saved. And I said, you mean Jesus died on a cross just so you could feel better about yourself? What about sin? Well, we don't want to talk about that because that's off-putting. <laughs> yeah, but that's the problem. <laughs> yeah? All of these trends and voices and many others exist within the evangelical faith, faith community. It's not, they're just not out there. They're around in the, in the churches in which we live and move and, and deal with. They, 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 they pose threats to a vibrant, spiritually healthy, growing Christian church. And, and they're not new. From the very beginning of the church, God's people have faced these kinds of challenges. The apostles warned against them. And when Paul wrote the Colossians, his letter is primarily in response to false teachers who had come into Colossae and offering them a, 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 a pseudo-spirituality, a, a super-spirituality, that goes beyond biblical Christianity. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's something more, something other than the simple gospel. And it was a noxious blend of, of philosophical nonsense and spiritual mysticism and legalism that sound really impressive and were drawing people away from the centrality of Jesus Christ. And in chapter 1, Paul laid a firm foundation of the truth because he's going to attack this thing in chapter 2 and begin to deal with the issues that were going on there. But he lays a foundation in the message of forgiveness from the Father, the gospel, by which God has transferred us from the kingdom of this world and trans and, and brought us into the kingdom of his son. He, he exalts in the supremacy of Jesus Christ as creator and Lord of all that he created and, and the sufficiency of the gospel and giving us a secure hope through faith in Christ. That's the burden of chapter one. And Paul was passionately committed to this message and was driven by a desire to serve people and to present every person he met as fully developed and fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 2, he begins to take up the burden of his warning. Listen to what he writes. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those in Laodicea, which is a town just down the road from Colossae, and for all who have not seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ." 
And, and Paul's burden, he says, I, I, I want you to know how great a struggle I have to you comes right out of his calling. And the last verse of the previous chapter, Paul said, for this I toil, struggling, struggling with all his energy that so powerfully works within me. The, the, <laughs> the Greek word there, and I'm giving you the Greek word because we get it in English, is agonizo. What does that sound like? Agonize, right? For this I agonize. And then he says, I want you to know what kind of agony I have for you in chapter 2. What kind of struggle I have. And for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face. Paul continues to expose his heart for the believers in Colossae and his struggle for the Colossians and in writing to them is to put courage back into their hearts by calling them to the loving unity built around the centrality of Jesus Christ. And that loving unity is critical that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love so that they can reach <laughs> full assurance of faith. You see, dealing with error, dealing with teaching that deviates or distracts from the centrality of Christ is discouraging, divisive work within a church family. Because people who would want us to drift off into error have relationships within the body that are tight. And when this error pops up and the church has to begin to deal with it, it begins to create friction and fractures in the body. For instance, in my previous church, we had a man who served well as an elder in the congregation. He had been a pastor of a Baptist congregation over in Illinois. And uh, they had deep roots in the church, a lot of connections with people in the family of God there. He was a gifted communicator. Sometimes when I'd be on vacation, I'd have him preach, and he was, he was gifted in the pulpit, good communicator. And then he came out with an unorthodox way of understanding certain moral convictions and practices with, with, with about gender and identity, and we had to take action to, pro to protect the church. Um... He came out in a very public way. It was on the front page of the Sunday paper. Um, and to go through this with our elders, with the congregation, was unsettling. And it mattered that the congregation be knit together in love as we sought to come to a full assurance of understanding. Controversy over unorthodox teaching is never merely an exercise in academic rigor. It is not done dispassionately, with dis detachment, with the kind of attitude by which we do chores around the house and take out the trash and make the bed and we just got to clean this mess up and then go on. I mean, it's intentionally relational. And relationships are always complex and entangled. And so as Paul engages this, he says, I want you, I want you to be encouraged and knit together in love so that together you can reach all the tr riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery. This can be a challenge, um, especially for those of us like m myself that are task oriented. We've got this problem, let's fix it and move on. You know, well, you've got a lot of people that are involved in this. And somehow we need to pulled together. And what happens when there's tension in the church is we tend to separate and get silent and pull apart. Right? That's when the church needs to come together. In times when truth is challenged, we've got to get tighter together, not further apart. And only then, together, and together is such a critical word, together, can we reach all the riches of full assurance and understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ himself? In other words, encouragement comes as we 
discover and do truth about Jesus Christ together. A great handicap of the American church is our cultural myth of the rugged individualist. Right? We're on our own. We're the Lone Ranger, the John Wayne. I don't know who it would be today. I'm reflecting my heroes. Uh, the people who stand alone against the culture, against the tide. Now we stand together. We celebrate our independent selves and declare our freedom to determine truth for ourselves, by ourselves. And the truth is that we do that in community in the body of Christ. This is not the world. This is the church. We do it together. And with humility, we, we need to be able to stand by our own convictions. But in the church of Jesus Christ, we need to stand together. We are one body in Christ under one Lord, and we are interdependent, not independent. There's a crucial difference between the two. We're in this together. And as we are knit together in love, then we can reach all the riches of full understanding and assurance of understanding. Paul invites us to plunge deeper into this mystery that he talks about. And, and by mystery, he did not mean what we typically mean when we watch a mystery on TV. In other words, there's a crime, and we've got a puzzle to solve, and we've got to solve the problem, and, and we're going to solve the mystery. Now, by, by mystery, he's talking about something that has been previously hidden, is now disclosed. In, in the Old Testament, in the Jewish scriptures, the prophets talked about a Messiah who would come and restore Israel to prominence, and he would. there were other strains of thought in those prophecies that people tended to overlook because they like the part about Jesus is going to be kind of like a mega David. And he's going to sit on the throne of David and propel Israel back as to the dominant force in the world. And, and they like that. And that's what they thought. And that's what they taught. And that's what they be, believed. And they interpreted these problems in, in nationalistic ways, triumphalist ways. They didn't understand Messiah would have to die for the sins of the world. And they really didn't understand he was going to be God made flesh. The son of God who would walk among them. They missed God's heartbeat for the world. So when Jesus came, he was a mystery to his people. <laughs> John says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. They rejected him. And it, was, it wasn't until after his crucifixion and resurrection that the disciples really began to understand who Jesus was and what he had come to do. And even then, there was so much more to learn as, as God's plan was unfolded further through the Apostle Paul specifically, who was entrusted with that mystery to bring to the Gentiles the message of the gospel and the fact that they are going to be included with the Jews as one new people in the body of Christ. And that's why Paul made the person of Christ in the gospel of Christ, central in his teaching and mystery and ministry. So it's only natural in the face of internal threats to the church, Paul would challenge the Colossians to dive deeper into what is truly at the heart of the Christian faith. All the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, who is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And when I hear those words, wisdom and knowledge, <laughs> my mind goes to the book of Proverbs, which is one of my favorite books. I, I love the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the wisdom literature. In chapter 2 of Proverbs, and it was a passage that my boys and I memorized when they were just little guys. I mean, old enough, maybe fourth grade, something like that. We memorized Proverbs 2. But Proverbs 2 of, uh, begins with this. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments within you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. And I wonder if this was in Paul's mind as he preached, as he, when he pointed to Jesus and said, there, look at Jesus. 
In Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and understanding. It comes from the Lord, but they're, they're hidden in Jesus Christ. Everything that Solomon was talking about, everything you ever wanted to know about mystery, knowing God, living well in a broken world, you can never plumb the depths of knowledge and insight offered by Jesus, and he fulfills your deepest need. That's what we got to keep central. Jesus still does teach us all that we need to live well in this world. The Colossians were being sidetracked by cleverly framed persuasive arguments that enticed them to invest their energies in things that were secondary distractions. One pastor said that nothing is so dangerous as feeble, under, feeble reasoning allied to fast talking. There are a lot of people who can sound really good, but they're going to take you down a, a dangerous path. We can be sidetracked in so many ways. We had a, we had a lady in our church in Eastern Oregon. It was just a, a lovely lady, a widow who invested a lot. She had remodeled her home to make it a place where other widows in the church and, and enjoy fellowship with Christ over meals and discussions and so on like that. Uh, just a very gracious lady. But she got she got sucked into a reclusive, hyper-legalistic group that was hung up on Bible translations and all kinds of things. And they alienated her from her family and from her friends. And she cut off all contact with the church family. It left many, many people, especially the widows in the church, bewildered and grieving. And nothing of what she got drawn into had anything to do with knowing Christ better. But it was about keeping the rules and making us look good. And she retreated into a rigid, grim bitterness to anyone who disagreed with her. That's tragic. Otherwise, important issues become dangerous distractions whenever they displace the cent centrality of Jesus Christ and him crucified and risen and coming again. The message of the gospel the central place of knowing Christ and growing in Him. We need, in all the issues that divide evangelical churches today, we need to stand for a fully informed biblical morality and ethics. We need doctrinal integrity. But so many of the discussions in churches, the things that divide us, distract us into things that take us away from that, destroy the unity of the body of Christ, and damage our witness in the world. They distance us from the full assurance that comes from knowing Christ in richer and fuller ways. So don't go in there. Don't go there. Don't get drawn away by anything that crowds out knowing Christ better. Anybody's hobby horse, press on together as one body to reach all the riches of full assurance and understanding of God's mystery, the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and understanding. Would you pray with me? Father, um, we ask that you would do this work in us, that you would help us as a congregation, as a church, as individual believers, to keep Christ central, to keep the body of Christ tightly knit together in love. Help us to know what it means to seek Christ together and to follow him in full obedience of faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.